uh, they think that they are too powerful. <laughs> so they, they, they won't think that they'll be investigated. <laughs> la, right? So it looks like those days are kind of coming to an... Uh, for, for, to an end, to, for some people. Uh, for some people. For some people. Yeah. Hey guys, welcome to the Are We OK podcast where we talk about public policies in ways that are relevant to you. The person on the street or in the shopping mall or in the Nasi Kanda stores. My name is Kian Ming. And, and I'm Peter. How are you, Peter? How's your weekend? I'm good. Uh, I had a lot of Nasi Kanda. <laughs> <laughs> I, saw, I saw your clips of my, uh, Mr. Mani. <laughs> a really good sample of different Nasi Kanda shots. Did you, the, did you, did you eat everything, uh, by the way? Uh, I took a bite of everything a little bit, tried to steal it. Uh, but the whole office uh, really had a Nasi Kanda party. Uh, then uh, the, the whole... Uh, office smell of nasi kanda after that all the curries and all that yes, very nice it smell did. <laughs> yeah and 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 the weird part is i thought i'm gonna have enough of it but what happened is that throughout the week i kind of keep thinking like where is actually a better nasi kanda aside from in kota daman sara area ah okay, okay. <laughs> there, are, there, there are a lot of places good nasi kanda places here today so let's uh go to listener feedback you know any interesting comments uh, based on the past episodes yes they are so let me just read out one of these comments here uh in terms of malaysia gov tech we could have adopted a co-creation approach by collaborating with the best tech malaysian firm in malaysia private sector for the benefit of malaysia i think that was in line with kind of like what we did talk about regarding padu right instead of uh, just relying on own resources, mm, internal maybe, resources, yeah, yeah. Opening it up with some uh, more expert private sector collaborating with them. Uh, I think it's fine uh, when we want to execute certain projects to bring in the private sector uh, for consultancy basis, stress tests, and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of initiating the framework of uh, you know different projects, uh, if let's say you have a very strong unit within GovTech, and I've seen that happen in in Singapore, uh, you actually can generate those ideas from within. Mm. Uh, so uh, again, example: uh, the person who's heading GovTech now uh, has proposed a project to revamp our postcode system. Oh, yeah, because oh, our wow. postcode system, if you look at Kota Damansara right now or mm. wherever you stay, right, is a huge area. Whereas for most uh, postcode systems that are accurate and and uh, much more specific, your postcode actually allocates a certain building to that postcode. Oh. Yeah. Wow, so, so ours it's like, supposed to be very precise. Yes, yes, it's supposed to be. Yep. So, you know, that was something that this person saw in other countries uh, and saw that this could be something that could be implemented in Malaysia. Uh, and I think the good thing about these kinds of projects being initiated at the first from within is that they know the cost. Mm. If let's say you start uh, doing RFPs, getting the private sector to come in, the private sector usually would ramp up the cost. Right, right. So that's right. that's something that we need to be careful of in terms of these IT projects. Like. Right. I remember right. what we said, you know, private sector, they come in, they will spend a lot on the, <laughs> the physical infrastructure. Yeah, especially the hardware part. <laughs> right? uh, yes, the hardware part. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, so that's yeah. one. Any, anything else? Let's move on to the next one. Uh, this one, okay. Interesting. This one is a really interesting comment, right? Uh, this has to do with uh, DAP versus MCA to a certain extent. Mm. Yeah, so I think you're in the right place to answer it. Yep. So this person said, actually on the ground, overall, MCA performed way, way better for the rakyat, all the people and races than DAP. Mm. Just based on their richer and deeper pocket, and much more organized machinery. Mm. So they are saying that DAP not as rich. Lah, huh? mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so DAP is quite hopeless in this area. I, I'm not sure whether he's saying hopeless in terms of organized or... Maybe uh, constituency servicing. <laughs> yeah, that, that one also, yeah. But more, more in terms of service. Yeah. I think so he mentioned that the lack of fund is quite major. So the only real weakness that MCA has at this point is that it has turned the Chinese against them wholesale. Is MCA slimy slinking into the same bit with pass? Yeah. Okay, so this uh, very loaded question. I'll just deal with the constituency servicing on, on, the, on the ground part. Uh, one has to realize that MCA has a long history in Malaysia. Uh, they, you know, uh, are into they, they have uh, you know branches and and uh, history of servicing even up to the you know new village level in very you mm. know uh, places that are can say a little bit outside the city areas lah. So no doubt, I think this person is right in saying that MCA has that a uh, better track record, uh, and also at, at the time when DAP was the Adun or the MP, we didn't have constituency uh, funding from the federal government because we were in opposition, right? But I think the tables uh, have uh, shifted quite significantly now that DAP has many more Aduns and MPs than uh, MCA. Uh, we can see our guys on the ground much more, 
and I think I can speak from experience, uh, we try to work together as a team uh, in order to serve the ground uh, and to make sure that our constituency allocation is actually spent in a way that, trans that is transparent mm. uh, so that you know there's no practice whereby, oh, uh, this particular association wants uh, allocation from us, then there's a middleman somewhere that charges 10, 20%. Right. Right, so that kind of practice, uh, you know, uh, I, I uh, didn't happen in my office, and I think it's something that we need to prevent from happening uh, within the DAP, so that we do not uh, get labeled in the same category as MC. Right. I, I actually have one question about that. Right, when we always talk about like um, MPs serving a place, we always talk about that like they need a lot of money, mm. right? They need uh, allocation and so on. And sometimes I really wonder like. If no money, really cannot do anything. Right? No, can, can. I mean, we, it will be much more difficult. Uh, it will be much more difficult for us to do infra projects, for us to repair schools, for us to give allocation and funding to the associations, for us to, mm. uh, you know, upgrade, uh, ma uh, you know, small sections of a market and, and roads and stuff like that. Uh, but if, let's say, you know, in the past, what we tried to do was we would try to raise funds from the public in order to run our office. Uh, right. Office expenses, I think that's something that uh, we need to cover at the very least. And then anything extra, we try to, uh, you know, give it to, to people who deserve it and then do some small infra infrastructure projects if possible. Right. right. So so I think that's, that's, that's uh, sort of like... A, uh, something that you know I've learned along the way as an MP. Uh, first, when I became an MP, I didn't really know these things, how to do it. But after two terms, I think uh, I've got a pretty good handle and I see many of my colleagues are doing a good job. Mm. Mm. Okay, now throw it back to you. Uh, this question, when he was the PM, no one dared to touch him as he got almost absolute powers. I'm, I think this is referring to uh, Tun Tun M. Uh, you know, for he, you know, he even dared to cut the wings of the sultans. Now he's out of power. Uh, but the authorities still dare not to touch him. Why? You know, afraid that he has, uh, you know, something uh, that would cause the government to fall. Or you know, what do you think? What, from a layman's perspective, why do you think uh, Tun M is so untouchable? This, this is where like I myself don't really have this question, right? Because like we we talk about sedition, you know, we talk about like uh, you shouldn't say things that's like you know disturbs you know, whatever not, lah, right? Mm -hmm. But in Malaysia, it seems like it only applies for certain people. Ah, certain yeah. people is above the law when it comes to these things, which ah. which I really find it perplexing. Mm. Uh, I mean, logically, I can think of it as that probably he's actually having a lot of power that is unseen. He's mm. probably uh, still having some sort of uh, invisible influence on a lot of things, which um, many people suspect so. But how true, uh, it all comes down to at this point, what I hear is just rumours, right? Which I don't think I should mention just in case I get a defamation <laughs> after that, right? <laughs> I mean, we're going to talk about, you know, some investigations by MACC uh, into yes, the wealth of yeah. one of his children. But I that think, is, uh, I, I think the, the, the thinking is that maybe uh, Tunem himself has a lot of uh, secrets uh, of other politicians, maybe. Uh, that's why, you know, the mm. action that is not taken against him. And also maybe the civil service, including the police, uh, may think that Tunem is a statesman. He's two-term uh, prime minister, he is somebody that should be accorded a certain level of respect. Uh, so, you know, don't go after him, at least at, at this point in time. I, I, I really don't have any other insider information into this beyond what we read in the newspapers. So. Mm. Okay, last question. You guys planning to continue on? If yes, please have it on Spotify too. What, what, what's, the, what's the plan here? Yes, so uh, this is definitely continuing. Uh, we have received a lot of good feedbacks. Yeah, yeah. and... Actually, it's already on Spotify. Yeah, it's just that the timing of upload uh, may Maybe have a, bit a little la. bit. Uh, okay. Yeah, because uh, in order for us to upload to Spotify, apparently you need to wait for another hour or something like that before it completely yes, uploads. uploads yeah. yeah. So unlike YouTube, when we set it at premiere at what time, then yes. it just goes up, right? Yes. So sometimes you guys may not feel like it, but nonetheless, if your traffic jam gets stuck, you know, whatnot, you can listen to it on Spotify. Just go and look for Are We OK? Okay, so um, if you really want to help us out, please click the subscribe button. We are about at uh, we are uh, around seven point five uh, yep. k vo uh, these subscribers. Hopefully, we can reach ten uh, k before Chinese New Year. That's right. Uh, yeah. With Hopefully your help, we can, we can reach it. it by the end of this month. Itself, end of this right? month itself. Yes, <laughs> that would so be a good target. Share it out. Yes, thanks. Take a break. We'll be right back. Hey guys, welcome back to Are We Okay, the podcast that talks about public policies in ways that are relevant to you. The first topic for this episode is corruption charges in Singapore uh, by the uh, former transport minister S. Iswaran, who has been charged with, with a number of uh, corruption charges, mostly to do with certain favours that he's 
uh, given to uh, this uh, public property developer Ong Bing Singh uh, in exchange for certain uh, promotion activities on the part of the Singapore Tourism Board uh, that focuses on the F1 F- Formula One race in, in Singapore. Mm. So in exchange, he got tickets to go and watch football, musicals and uh, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, when when you read the this case and the details, what was your reaction? I think the first thing is that uh, it is quite uh, shocking to a certain extent because this is the first time after many, many years the mm. minister actually really get charged in yes. a sense, right? Yeah. Uh, since 1986, if I... Ah, a long uh, time ago, call. yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and in squeaky clean Singapore, this is yes, not something... Yes, yes, uh, yes. And just at the time, the person that is involved, uh, Ong Beng Singh, uh, also had some uh, previous controversial with uh, the scandal with like, Lee family a little bit involved and stuff. Yes, and right yes. Now, yeah, with the con- sale yeah, of condos and stuff like that's that. That's right. Yeah. And right now, they are about... You know, Lee Hsien Loong is talking about... Uh, you giving know, way to the next generation, to the next generation yeah, next, next PM, yeah. now suddenly all these things happening, it's yeah. quite like, hmm, okay. <laughs> Were you surprised, uh, you know, in terms of the, the, the details of those uh, charges, you know, uh, exchanging sort of like favours and getting back these uh, tickets and uh, all these kinds of, you know, maybe the amount is not that large. W- what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so as well as a Malaysian, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I look at the list of things that he uh. received, uh, totally about, Close to four hundred thousand uh, Sing, Sing dollars, dollars yeah, uh. right, and most of it are actually tickets to F one, uh. uh, tickets for musical, yeah, some football uh, games, football yeah. game, yeah. hotel. Uh, so I come to know that this guy actually likes F one, uh, uh. likes football, uh. likes musical. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes, correct. Yeah. <laughs> and a uh, couple that are a bit more uh, exaggerated will be like a private jet flight, yeah, right? Stuff, but yeah. honestly. Uh. I think in the Malaysian context, because we are quite used to... Uh, maybe bigger uh, scandals. Or bigger bigger scandal, corruption scandals, yeah. So, yes, yeah. And, and also, I guess no gift practices in Malaysia has only started not too long. Like, and mm. we don't really strictly adhere to it. And, and it's quite normal for a Malaysian to say, hey, you want to come over to a musical? I'm, I'm going to a musical. I've got a track ticket, right? Sure. And it's quite normal for a... Like, I would do that to my friend. Mm. Has, he can't give me any benefit. Mm. It, it's just something very normal, right? So when I look at the list of charges and everything, all, I, I just go like, wow. Mm-hmm. Only in quite, Singapore. <laughs> uh, quite, quite pale in comparison to yeah. the regions around. Yes. Uh, and I, I think in Malaysia, it would have been just, you know, what under, under the, the carpet. Yeah, yeah, it's just like, yeah. talk about it and then... There's business as usual. Business <laughs> as usual, right? Yeah, but yeah. they took it really seriously this time. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's part and parcel of the Singapore ethos where, you know, PAP has set itself a very high benchmark in terms of... Uh, uh, you know, it, it being a clean government. And I think when I saw uh, that Iswaran has stepped down as a minister as well as MP uh, to in order to, to defend himself, uh, you know, the Deputy Prime Minister and incoming Prime Minister Lawrence Wong uh, made very strong statements uh, in terms of uh, the standards that PAP leaders and MPs have to adhere to. And I think it's good because it sends a signal to future yep. generations, future, uh, you know, leaders and even current ones in Singapore that... Uh, you know, you have to, you have to know, uh, you know, you have to be appear whiter than white, so to speak. Yeah. Right. In terms of their, their ethicals and morals. Yeah. Yeah. So here I have a question for you, right? Because uh, so many years you've been in uh, politics and mm. you've also been part of the deputy minister. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, Malaysia is one of a kind when it comes to comparing to Singapore uh, mm. or either other country is that generally when there's a minister who does something wrong or either getting charged or either being suspected of something, mm. even sometimes over funny remarks that they make, they would resign. Right? Yeah, yeah, they yeah, would yeah. apologize yeah. and resign. Yeah, yeah. But in Malaysia, generally this practice doesn't happen. Yeah, double down and yeah, stay double on. Double down, <laughs> stay on and yeah. then still get supporters, uh, right? Yes, yeah, yes, We have yes, seen yes. it happening so many times. Yes. And uh, what are your personal thoughts to this? Uh, should a minister actually step down when he makes some sort of a mistake? I think it depends on the gravity of the mistake. Uh, I think if, let's say, you're charged for corruption, um, it, it's serious enough to warrant uh, you know, taking, uh, taking time off from some of your political activities uh, in order to focus to defend your, in, in defending yourself. Uh, so, so that would be my personal sort of like line. Uh, of course, uh, this is not something that is uh, practiced regularly in Malaysia. Uh, you know, some people even draw the line uh, higher to say that if let's say you say make a statement that uh, brings disrepute to the government right in terms of making a racist statement something that's uh, sexist and all that uh, 
uh, you should step down as an MP. Mm. Uh, you know, maybe we'll get to that stage one day. Uh, but right now, I think we're quite far from that. La. And, and, and I also want to share a bit of experience. So for us, you know, whether we're in the opposition or we are in, in government, uh, when people want to, let's say, contribute to our party, uh, you know, in, in politics, uh, there are ways of doing it uh, in the sense that you can deposit money into uh, the, the party branch account or, or the HQ account. Uh, and that's not illegal, right? Uh, you know, the part that's illegal, if let's say that contribution comes with uh, you having to exchange certain favors, especially when you're in government. Right. Right. So that's where, you know, uh, MACC would come in to, to investigate. Uh, and I think for me personally, when I was deputy minister, uh, I was uh, never offered a bribe. Bri maybe because I didn't have executive power, uh, maybe because people didn't think that I would uh, be susceptible to those kinds of uh, moves. Uh, but yeah, anything above 500 ringgit, uh, we have to declare. Mm. Right? So, you know, I'm not sure whether you remember when Anthony Luke was uh, the Minister of Transport for the first time, you know, he, uh, you know, received a handphone as a, as a yeah. gift, uh, you know, because he appeared as the guest of honor. When he opened it up and then he saw there was a handphone, he actually returned it back, you know, to, oh. the, to, the, to the organizer. Right, right, right. So, you know, uh, yeah. But like for me, People know who I. People know my preferences, whether in government or out of government. Uh, usually, they will give me books, lah, and the books are usually less than five hundred. <laughs> <ringgit. laughs> so, so then now we move on to the next thing that I really am very curious about. This yeah. right is like for his case like that. Uh, it is just an exchange of like you know, uh, tickets and so on. And to say that because of that he kind of gave approval on certain projects. It there's that question of uh, whether was it written in paper to say oh, I'm definitely gonna give you or or was it just a word of mouth? You know, is there any trails and evidence? Uh, right? But on the other hand, right, there's this question about like, isn't it like when the time when you were a minister or like you see a lot of other people being a minister, uh, if it's above 500 ringgit, but let's say for example, if I bring you for a fine dine and genuinely I'm your friend mm. and genuinely I own that restaurant mm. or genuinely I really had a free ticket, you know, as friends, it was much easier. Hey, yeah, you want to bring me a go lah. Let's go lah, right? But, at the moment you are an MP, at the moment you are a minister, you, you kind of have to change everything around. Uh, you, you, you have to draw your own lines. La. Yeah, so how yeah. do you manage that? So, so for example, for me, uh, you know, when I was a minister, uh, I, I would not, let's say, go to a place where uh, they would comp you, uh, a hotel and all that. Uh, and this place, let's say, has... Uh, uh, you know, uh, run gambling op operations, for example. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I mean, I, I make that, uh, you know, I make that well known, uh, You know, that that uh, that that is uh, sort of like a personal line, uh, and uh, you know, tickets to these kinds of concerts and all that. I think, uh, you know, I may get offers, and then I will say, okay, if you want to give, then I give it to my staff, mm. right? So uh, let my staff enjoy those kinds of privileges, uh, But for me myself, I've not again, I've not. Uh, been in that situation before where they where tickets were offered to me uh, but I think if I were to get those tickets I, I would uh, I would uh, you know give give them away to others to enjoy la. right right yeah. now then the next thing is this right uh, part of this core scandal thing that I actually dig up and I was looking at it was uh, one of the parts was that the Lee family scandal with the Nasim Jade property right was actually mm. about a discount right and I was thinking to myself again in, in the Malaysia context uh mm. And what we are always hearing, this is again very fake, very, you know, very mm. small. And yeah, even small. I myself, la, sometimes when I talk to developers, I also go ask them, hey, since I'm doing here and there for you, is it possible that I can get a stop discount from you? Mm, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> quick pro quo. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's not like, I, I don't really see it as a bribe, you know, I just genuinely mm. think that, hey, we are friends. It's kind of like your friend work in Apple or work in like, you know, sure. Gap, and then you say, hey, can help me get stuff discount? I'm sure that many of the audience here have that, right? Mm. And so... Okay, hypothetical situation. Yeah. Uh, hypothetical. Hy totally hypothetical, not casting us, uh, you know, making any claims uh, one way or the other, another. If let's say, uh, you were the Prime Minister of a certain country, uh, country S, mm. <laughs> and then <laughs> you have, uh, you know, you, are, you have uh, family members, you have, you have children, you have uh, mm. grandkids, you know, and then the developer comes to you and say, okay, because of your great contribution to the country, I will offer not just you, but your entire family one unit in this ultra exclusive uh, condominium project that I'm developing, and I will give each of you a twenty percent discount. Mm. 
you know, w- would you feel that that is okay? No. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, G got a line ready, yeah. Yeah. Got a line yeah. ready. Ah, so. So then there's a uh, question: How do you draw uh, the line? Because it's a very, it's a line that 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 doesn't have a textbook answer. Okay. Right? So, so I, I think I think for me, maybe just close it off uh, at, at this part. Uh, if let's say you are able to defend your decisions in public, mm. defend your decisions in public in parliament, uh, you know this is why I, I did this, and you feel that you've done nothing wrong, uh, then just go out and defend it. And that's what Lee Kuan Yew did for the Nasim Jade uh, purchase, uh, the discount. He went to say what he had to say in in parliament, but at the end of the day, he returned the discount by donating it to charity. Mm. Right, so yeah. you know that in itself shows you, you know, the the kind of public pressure, and That's this right. was in the early 1990s when you didn't have social media. Imagine now with social media, you can do the same thing, and if let's say a minister and his family received the same kind of discounts and went to parliament and justified it, I think uh, in Singapore the, the the context is actually quite different. Yeah, now. I do realize that when it comes to uh, Singapore, they are very quick to admit it and rectify it as soon as possible. Even even I, I mean, it may not be a fault. To a certain times, but mm. as long as the public thinks like that, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna do the right thing mm. to show you that I I'm okay with it, sure. right? Uh. Yeah, I think that is one part that uh. I feel like every minister should have, lah. Yeah. Whereas for Malaysia's case, you know, then <laughs> Prime Minister Najib was avoiding questions on when it be like it was the plague, lah. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> comes back, come back to Malaysia, and uh, you know, w- there's uh, also news of the uh, MACC. Investigation into one of Atun Mahathir's children, Mirzan Mahathir, uh, asking him to declare his wealth and the sources of his wealth in 30 days. Mm. Right. So you know, I, I sent you some information in terms of the kind of businesses that Mirzan owns and all that kind of stuff. Yep. What, what was your reaction when you read through the, the the assets that he had and the wealth and all that? Oh, so uh, I dig into it, read up on the things. I realized that he owns a part of the chairman and at least in the leadership board of like uh, uh. these different firms, right? Like Consortium Logistics, Petron, Petron yeah. Crescent, yeah. Betamec, you know, yeah. which produces the AV system yeah. for our pro uh, San Miguel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think, wow, this guy, very smart, huh? Mm. Good very, connections. Very, very smart. Good yeah. investor. Very good investor. Huh? Uh, With uh, over 1 billion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dust touch, you know. Mm, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. My dust touch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Purely a merit, right? You think? Uh, uh, that, that's what he said. Uh, okay. That's what he said. Huh? Okay. Uh, purely a purely merit. merit la, merit la. Huh? Okay, okay, yeah, okay. The yeah. whole family itself is also all very intelligent people. Uh, uh, very all well connected. Of them, uh, mm. Uh, I think the least successful person in the whole family is uh, more successful than uh, many of the people I know. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, yeah, so I think this one, you know, the, the larger issue here is, uh, you know, linked to what we had talked about last week, investigation to Daim. Uh, you know, we already speculated and yep. so has ma- many other people that it will go, uh, you know, lead to investigation into members of uh, Tun and Mate's family. Uh, there's also another corporate uh, leader uh, in Mate's family, uh, Mogzani. Mm. Uh, who has also a lot of uh, corporate interests as well, probably a bit more than Mirzan. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see whether this continues and also uh, how Mahathir will fight back. And he has fought back already. Oh, yeah. He has yeah. fought back already. You know, he's issued certain statements and yeah. all that. Yeah. He said that uh, they are threatening his son with a five-year jail term, you know, mm. and stuff like that, right? Mm. Um, but the next thing is that they, they're asking him to declare all his asset in just 30 days. And sometimes I'm thinking of myself, right? Uh, all these guys, like even including uh, Tun Daim, right? To declare their asset itself uh, is something that immediately they will, mm. you know, whoa, let's stop that, right? Mm. Uh, yeah, get I mean, them worried. Yeah. Mm. To to a certain reason, as a as a private citizen myself, mm. I I can understand the pressure. I also don't want everyone to know what I own. Mm. That's number one, mm. right? Uh, but number two, I think if you are someone of a public interest, you should have prepared for that day when you need to declare asset. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you should have prepared. La. Mm. I'm not saying that you want to declare immediately, but you should have prepared mm. because you will know that this day is going to come. So that's why it's more important to live clean and make sure that things are... I will push back. La. I will push back a bit on that because actually most most people uh, you know, who are who's out of that level, uh, they think that they are too powerful. So <laughs> they, they, they won't think that they will be investigated. <laughs> la. Right. So looks like those days are kind of coming to an... Uh, for... for 
to an end to for some people. Ah, for some people. For some people. Yeah, for some people. So, for some so it's people. like it's not gonna be like last time, like where when you're of a certain party, it's gonna be forever there, right? <laughs> yeah. So the 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 statistic of you needing to declare one day is uh, higher than last time already. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, we'll take a break and then we'll come back and talk about water hikes. Welcome back, guys, to the Are We Okay podcast. I'm Ken Ming and I'm Peter. So next topic we want to talk about is the hikes in the water tariff starting on the 1st of February mm. uh, and also relating that to the water cuts in Penang. But before we go into that, can I ask you, uh, Peter, do you pay your water bills yourself or you your wife does it? What was the deal here? Uh, at your my home? wife does it. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. I, I don't really do you don't really do bills. Bill paying. Uh. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I pay most of the bills in my house. Uh, and that keeps me updated with uh, any billing changes right. uh, and also how the systems are developed. So uh, my TNB, for example, is, is very good. Uh, it's very yeah. easy, very seamless in terms of payment. Uh, although the FPX system sucks, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, yeah, so for water bill, I, I do I do pay it and I do see the, the bill itself. It's For me, it's not much. It's about 6 to 10 ringgit. Uh, yep. Do you have any idea what your bill is? Uh, around that as well, according to what my wife has told me. Yeah, okay. usually minimal. Okay, so the increase uh, that was announced uh, last week is that the uh, tariff rate would increase from about one forty three cents, one ringgit forty three cents per cubic meter, uh, to about one ringgit sixty five cents per cubic meter. So increase of twenty two cent, uh, you know, won't affect that many, uh, you know, uh, consumers in a very big way. Uh, maybe more than fifty percent of the consumers will only see less than a ten ringgit increase in their their bill but of course uh you know people have uh, responded yeah uh, you know and say that you know hey we shouldn't increase bills uh water tariff and all that when when people are suffering and all that what, what, what is your view on that uh i think that the amount is not great mm. and i think they should increase la, in my okay. opinion because to a certain extent we have a uh, quite a lot of issue that need money to resolve so here's where you can uh kind of get everyone to contribute just a few dollars but make up to a sure. huge number to actually make changes yeah so i'll come back to the changes especially from an infra part later on but um maybe you know just to 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 discuss uh why people think uh we, we know when they, why why the masses have this reaction when people announce uh, the increase in the water tariff when the government announced the increase in the water tariff because you think about it right if let's say you know the fast food chain or the mama store increase uh, you know the the drinks by twenty cent, thirty cent, forty cent. You won't actually hear people, you know, go and scream and shout about it, yep. correct? Right. And I think there's a few reasons behind this. Firstly, uh, when you know the F and B outlet increase their prices, uh, people have alternatives, yep. right? If they this one increase a lot, then I go to one that increase less, right? But for government services, uh, you know, whether it's your assessment, your quit rent, water, electricity, uh, those are essentials. And and in the current context in Malaysia, you don't have any other alternatives so that's one second thing is a lot of these issues have been politicized right including when you know uh, PH was in opposition yeah. every time anything goes up oh kerajaan tak prihatin <laughs> kerajaan tak peduli government doesn't care these kind of things right so I think that's also I think doing a disservice to uh, the need to you know have these kinds of regular incre increment because you know face it you know we have to face the fact that uh, cost increase uh, you know, we also have to face the fact that we have to, uh, you know, uh, replace infrastructure, old pipes and things like that. Even, yes. you know, if, you know, if I stay in a condo or if, if you own your own uh, landed property, if you stay in a condo, you have to contribute towards, uh, you know, the sinking fund. That's right. Right. Your maintenance and the sinking fund goes towards, uh, you know, uh, you know, replacement of lathes, mm. roofs, that kind of stuff. Right. So I think, uh, you know, the, the, that's why the government also needs to understand uh, these are the reasons why people maybe have a little bit more of a uh, adverse reaction towards uh, these kinds of uh, increases. Like. Yeah, yeah. I think I think one thing that when it comes to the Malaysia water system, right? I think a lot of people actually don't notice that our water system is actually very old. There's always been a talk about changing all the piping, mm. but there are a few things uh, not enough money la, uh, and then how to actually really implement it la, because mm. it's so complicated, right? Apparently, it was already set up during uh, pre Madeka times, right? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, then, yeah. like, yeah. There, there's always been talks about replacing, like, don't know how many of it. Yeah, 50 year old pipes and yeah, things like that. And I yeah. think Penang is the only one with that 
currently uh, with a very strong political will to say that oh we're gonna do some replacement but i think you're gonna go into that uh, a little bit more later yeah so actually yeah. for you know we can go into it now you know penang experienced its worst uh, water cuts uh, you know in uh, earlier this month uh, over four days uh, they had to you know stop water supply and uh, you know you, you had to replace a major pipe uh, that supplied water from uh, from the major water treatment plant in uh, Butterworth uh, to the island and also to other parts of uh, the mainland. Uh, so it was it was a huge issue. Uh, first time something major like that had happened in Penang for the past 15 years. Lah. And uh, going back to the issue of being politicized, again, this is something that, you know, maybe us in KL, we won't notice. Um, you know, I'm going to ask you, you know, do, do you realize or did you get a sense that there was a lot of uh, political pressure coming from within Pakatan Harapan, uh, the Pakatan Harapan government on the Chief Minister Chow Kon Yao as a result of this uh, water issue? I think in the KL side, not really. Mm. We didn't read much about it. Yeah. N- the you sense don't feel of it, it is not. Much. Yeah, don't feel it that much. Yeah. yeah, but in Penang, I can tell you for a fact that the people felt it. Uh, you know, not just feeling the the the, the water cuts, uh, but also the political pressure, because uh, there was a letter that was uh, released to the press, uh, where where nineteen Pakatan Harapan MPs and Aduns uh, demanded uh, for the uh, Penang uh, Water uh, Authority, uh, the PBA, um, to. The, the CEO to come out to really explain uh, and uh, the to the rakyat what PBA is doing to help with the water supply issue. Right. Right. So this is something that's quite, uh, from a political standpoint, uh, again drawing uh, pulling back the curtain, uh, is something that's quite significant because you are you are getting the MPs of your and Aduns of your own government to issue a statement against somebody who's put there by the chief minister. Right. Uh, so, Ooh, uh, okay, uh, okay. So, so, okay. so that is that is. Uh, you can see lah. You know, people say hidden hands or whatever, trying to put pressure right. on the chief minister. The other thing that that I think uh, some people took notice of. I mean, I certainly did because uh, Chao Kon Yao is uh, from my party, and uh, you know, I I think he was trying to do his best under those difficult some circumstances. There was a video of uh, Lim Guan Ying, uh, leaked video of Lim Guan Ying. Uh, you know, uh, being very, uh, you know, um, demonstrative. Uh, in, in complaining about uh, how uh, you know the state government wasn't doing enough to uh, reach out to the public uh, in a closed door briefing, Ooh. right? So that is again also a criticism against the uh, you know Chief Minister right. Chow. So I think both 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 of them have their own strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Guaning no doubt uh, is a much more hands-on guy. Mm. Uh, under his watch, there were no water disruptions, right? Mm. So the 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 pressure that he put on PBA to perform is very very high, right? Right. Whereas Chow, I think uh, a little bit more laid back, uh, but I think for this water water pipe replacement issue, it was something that was a long time coming, lah. And I think he felt he needed to do something, uh, so that the next person doesn't have to deal with this uh, major problem. And you know, he's th- there will be these kinds of continued uh, water pipe replacement issues, and also the political pressure that will come from within mm. uh, as a result of these uh, water challenges in mm. Penang. So th- this comes to uh, two parts of the story that I have a question about, right? Mm. The first thing is that he, m- public communication, uh, and we have talked about it many times, that government should actually, whatever government, state government, federal government, should actually really communicate more what they are trying to do mm. you know, with the people yep. rather than just uh, leave it up to guesses and newspaper to report, right? That That's number one, right? Uh, and number two is, what do you think about all this kind of uh, internal party competition, right? Uh, is it actually good or bad? Yeah. Yeah, so I think on the first part, what would have been good if there could have been a whole of government approach la, at the state level, whereby the the chief minister worked together with the individual adons and MPs to really show that they are going down to the ground to help the people put in, mm. uh, you know, water reservoirs at strategic locations, especially places where uh, there's a lot of uh, B40 living in those uh, old flats and stuff like that, where the water tanki is not sufficient to hold water up to four mm. days. You know that that kind of stuff really shows uh, the caring nature of a government. Yeah. And I think Chow and his government tried to do that, but maybe not enough to placate everyone, mm. right? And and in those circumstances, it may not have been possible to placate everyone. That's right. Because you cannot suddenly just uh, you know guarantee water supply in the same way when you shut off water uh, <laughs> uh, for for four days, lah. You know there will be some places where people will complain, one. Lah. But you can be more proactive about it, which was what I think the point that Guan was making. The second issue with regards to these kinds of internal politicking, I think really depends on uh, how you want to position it. Uh, 
uh, there's all there will always be internal politicking. The decision that I think politicians make on a regular basis, uh, you know, including from my own party, is to what extent they want to highlight this and uh, and reveal this to the public, right? Because when you reveal this to the bu- public, uh, uh, Chinese will say "hanan uh, kan," not yeah. nice to see. Don't air or dirty ah, laundry. Yeah, correct, that's correct. what they say, right? Correct, correct. Yeah. So, but th- then sometimes some people may feel that there's no choice. Because if you do not respond to internal demands or internal pressures for you to do certain things, the only option you have is to go out to the public to put pressure on certain politicians uh, publicly. Right, right. Mm. So as a, as a right guard, whenever I see these kind of things, right, uh, I usually, as long as it's not too ugly, I feel like it's quite good because it gives me this sense of like there's accountability. There's accountability mm. that you are still check and balancing against each other. It's not like oh, these guys from my party, so therefore I don't really bother like that. So from a you know right standpoint, sometimes I feel good about it as long as it doesn't escalate mm, correct, to correct. be too dramatic, lah. Yeah. So I think the the challenge is where do you draw the line? Where does it escalate to a point where it becomes really dirty and ugly and also not very productive? Yep. Right. In fact, it may become even counterproductive. Yep. Right. So um, maybe just a little bit more about this water uh, tariff hike thing. I think it's not sufficient to just hike the the tariff uh, and not explain to the people what you're doing with the, the hike. La. So uh, Span has come out with a statement to say that even after hiking it to 165, the real cost of producing the water on average is about 175. So you're still mm. subsidizing it, right? Uh, and at the same time, you know, you come up with plans like, for example, Slangor, uh, is uh, covering the increase in cost to all the B40 families that have applied under under a scheme. Uh, you know this will affect about uh, a million people. So a million people, you know, about three hundred thousand accounts will be helped uh, because of this assistance that will be given uh, that is given by the Selangor State Government. They will cover like let's say about thirteen ringgit lah yep. uh, for these uh, for these families. Not not me and you. Uh, you know yeah. we can afford people it. People are uh, earning others, below five thousand. Yes, and they have to and, apply and to apply. this. Exactly. Uh, and also, uh, I think MOF has done a good move. Uh, they've increased the allocation for the uh, miskin tega or the hardcore poor uh, starting this month uh, from 600 ringgit per household to 1,200. Mm. Uh, about 700,000 households will be helped. So maybe this will also help uh, you know, lessen some of the burden. So there are these th- things can be done. But I think a lot more on the policy side can be done to put in uh, certain things that can en- encourage people to save water. Right? Uh, Singapore has a water conservancy charge. Mm. We don't. Uh, things like incentives to give developers, individuals, institutions, uh, you know, to put in water saving devices, mm. uh, to put in rainwater harvesting capabilities, mm. right? So you can save water, uh, and and you know, these are the kind of policies that we want to see ruled up more of. So that it's not just about pricing, but it's the entire ecosystem mm. that we need to develop. So you also shared with me your uh, press statement that you actually yeah written, this morning yeah yeah this morning yeah. Uh, and I I thought there's this one part that that really got my attention right was regarding uh, how it's actually a first mover disadvantage when it comes to housing development mm. in regards to putting off the piping system. I, I think there's something that you should probably share with the public, right? So yeah. they actually understand mm. the thing that we take for granted so much, which is we just get water in our housing development. Actually, there's quite a lot of things happening at the back, right? Yes, and, and this actually uh, points to a, a longer term challenge that, that government and developers have. La. If let's say I'm building a new development, I happen to be the first developer there, whether it's residential, commercial, industrial. Uh, the water authority, let's say, you know, I Slango and Slango would say, okay, I need you to build this pipe. This pipe is how many kilometers long? It costs 50 million ringgit. You have to build it, you have to bear the cost. Uh, but if as let's a say, as right? a developer, as the first developer, if let's say another developer comes in, uh, oh, they just pay the connection fee. <laughs> the initial capex has been built by somebody else. Right, so there are moves to try to sort of like get to get a few developers together to share the cost, uh, but there's it's not done in a very systematic way. Right, right. So that is why you know, other than increasing this uh, water tariff, you also need to come up with structures uh, that is fair to developers uh, and also people who are building these kinds of uh, you know developments, uh, so that uh, at the end of the day. Uh, you do not overburden developers who then inevitably will pass the cost down to the consumer. Right, right. Actually, wow, it's because of this particular statement that you made, right? That, that made me realise uh, it, it actually poses a great challenges, f- poses a great challenge for especially rural areas. Because if I'm a developer who wants to develop a rural area, right? Mm. I've got a huge problem. I don't want to be the first one to go in. Exactly. <laughs> Which <laughs> means a lot of money, man. that there will be very little development on the That's private right. sector side. So in everybody's the just area. waiting for each other, you know? Exactly. Unless you have a big 
industry player that goes in, builds a huge uh, you know factory, and that person is willing to that company is willing to foot the cost lah. So yeah, this is something that we need to uh, keep track of, take note of, and it's something that I think I, I learned only because I was involved in politics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because if not, you probably didn't know about I, it. As I didn't well, know right? about it. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know about it. And <laughs> and just by you telling me that, I was thinking of myself. Yeah, there should be some sort of a policy structured around it. Like yes. for example, if you guys were to buy those land there, we would have charged you upfront for the the yeah, the, the development charge, for example, for yes. for uh, putting through a pipe or something. Yes. Then. What happened is that because I'm already paying a part of it, yeah. I will be rushing into to faster develop as soon as I can. Sure. Right. Yes. Instead of like waiting for the first guy to develop first, so yes. I can hot right on the cost saving, exactly. you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that should be something formally put in, so that it can really help the development of the nation. Uh. Yeah. That is why we make public policy relevant to you guys, and we'll be right back after this. Welcome back to the Are We OK podcast where we talk about public policies in ways that are relevant to you. Okay, uh, one thing which is relevant to you is the issue of local councillors. Uh, although it may not seem uh, that apparent, uh, but you know, Peter, uh, when you want to make complaints about your you know, potholes outside your, your house or uh, traffic lights not working or the drains are being stuck, do you know who you should uh, approach in t- in terms of making those complaints? I do not know. So I have this big pothole right in front of my house okay. and a pipe that bursts. Uh. So I've been calling uh, uh, MBSA uh, uh. and MBSA say that it is uh, under Roadworks. Uh. Then Roadworks say it's under MBSA. <laughs> then after that, they start dilly-dallying uh. until today is still unresolved. And I don't know who so the water to is still talk flowing. to. It's still flowing until today. Yeah, and I don't know who to talk to. Okay. I tried uh, emailing MP side, you know, whatever not, also got no respondent. So okay. <laughs> I really don't know what to do. So it's possible for you to reach out to the MP or the state count, state uh, Adun uh, for your area uh, to help them, uh, to uh, let them know and then see whether they can assist. Uh, but one person who would be able to assist at the local level is the local councillor. So we don't have elected local councillors, uh, unlike other democracies, uh, but these are all appointed by... Uh, the state government. Right. So, so in, what is the local council? Is it like Penghulu, those kind of people? Uh, there are Penghulus about? as well. Ketua Kampung, Penghulus. Uh, that, that one probably, uh, you know, we leave for another uh, episode. But the local councillors are people who are in charge of certain districts and zones within each local council. So right. MBSA will be in Shah Alam, mm. right? Uh, MPPJ will be, uh, you know, in PJ. Uh, this is where, you know, the Kota Damansar is located. Mm. Uh, you have some of the larger local councils, uh, including uh, uh, Subang Jaya, for example, uh, that covers Puchong. Uh, yeah. My own constituency, former constituency of Bangi, is uh, uh, MPKJ or right. Kajang. Right. So, in each local council, there are twenty-four local councillors, uh, and each one of them is assigned a zone. Mm. Right. So, you know, uh, if they do their work, uh, you know, if they go down and meet the residents and uh, the different. Uh, you know, resident associations and, and you know, the talk to them about the different issues, uh, you know, they would be the point person that you talk to, even though in that case, it may not be MBSA, it may be, uh, for example, Ice Lango, who's supposed to fix the pipes. Uh, but they would know because they are experienced in right. this. La. And the reason why I want to bring this up is because, uh, you know, Amno in Slango recently made a statement. Uh, they returned back 20 local councillor positions back to the Slango state government. Uh, and then in return, they wanted to have uh, 300 over uh, Ketua Kampung positions, right? <laughs> so no, to, the, to the man on the street, you may say, hey, why does this matter to me? You know, it doesn't affect me in any way. Uh, but I want to tell you that it, it does uh, because, number one, if let's say there are 20 local councillor positions in all the different uh, you know, local councils that are supposed to be given to UMNO, but uh, they've not taken it up because they don't want to for whatever reason, uh, this means that all these positions will be unfilled which means mm. that your particular area, if you are supposed to have an UMNO councillor, uh, in effect, you won't have a local council representative. Right. Right. So this may affect you if, let's say, there are serious things that are happening on the ground in your area, like a major burst pipe, there may be some flooding, there may be some uh, tanarunto and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, you know, there's so, no one there to handle that, right? I mean, the local council will still step in, but if you have a local councillor who's there, who's on the ground, uh, that person will be able to assist you right. and help you out in a much more direct and uh, immediate way. Mm. Yep. So on the part of AMNO, I think this is part and parcel of a larger political play whereby uh, they are saying, you know, we want more, but if you give us 20, we don't want to take it. You know, we only want to take the 
uh, penghulu or ketua kampung position which is maybe in their minds closer to the grassroots and there are people are, who are saying you know hey look you know we are giving you these local councillor positions even though you have two seats in the state government in Selangor whereas PH has uh, 10 11 seats in Johor and we don't get any local councillors yeah right so there's this uh, imbalance this this uh, this unfairness uh, and uh, you know um, that that's very obvious in in Johor because uh, you know the PH is not part of the state government mm. right so i think this is uh, part and parcel of how local government local councils uh, this issue gets played up uh, you know and uh, it, you have to understand uh, some of the local dynamics as well as some of the inter-party dynamics to understand the importance of this. Yeah, so I think as, as a right guard who actually have not much of a clue of what does a Pengulu does or Ketua Kampung does and mm. uh, I didn't even know that like a local council to a certain effect is, is part of this whole picture. I know Aduns, mm. uh, I know that they are more like uh, state government servants, right? Mm. But I never thought of it as related to party politicking <coughs> as yep. part of the thing. Yeah. So maybe we should actually do one episode to actually talk about it. So at least the people out there, right? You know how to reach out to the right people when you need help. Because I think these roles, uh, the more you talk about it, the more I realize that it is actually probably the first line where you get in touch with the government and say, hey, I received some sort of a help. Like mm. for me, imagine if my local council is the one that I call and he helped me solve my pothole issue, mm. I will feel grateful about it. Yeah. And, I'll, and it will positively reflect on whatever party that he was trying to promote or he bears a, a flag off, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, good, good suggestion. I think uh, the new batch of councillors have been sworn in you know, recently, including in PJ. Uh, we should get one of the newer local yeah. councillors to come and sit here uh, you know, to, to explain what uh, he or she feels his role should be and what he or she is doing as a new councillor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe just before we end uh, on this uh, topic, I also want to, to let you know that there's a very close relationship between the local councillors and the Adun as well as the MP. Because each Adun and MP, they want to appoint local councillors from their own party to serve in the areas that are the most important to them. Mm. Right. So the local councils councillors are there as sort of like a the arms and legs of the Aduns and the MPs. Mm. Uh, the worst situation that can happen to an MP or Adun if let's say uh, the local councillor who is appointed for a period of two years and let's say close to elections, that, that local councillor suddenly disappears and doesn't oh. serve. Or even they continue to serve but they undermine the Adun or the MP. I've seen these kind of things oh. happen. Uh, I've had some personal experience uh, on this as well. Uh, and this is where some of these... Uh, uh, which is why these local council positions are heavily sought after. Uh, there's a lot of intense lobbying and jockeying, even within political parties, right. uh, to say, "Oh, I, I want to put my person there. I want to put uh, the other person wants to put his person there." It becomes quite an intense lobbying uh, effort. Right? Cause is it is it because, like, for example, if I'm an MP of this place and my local council maybe is uh, from a different party, and let's say we are opposition, right? We don't like each other. Mm. Then whatever whatever effort that I as an MP or Adun who says that I want to do for this place, they can kind of like delay it, it, sabotage yeah. it a little bit or so on. Yeah. But on the other hand, if let's say this is my friend, mm. to a certain extent, even without the need to raise funds, mm. I could actually pay attention to certain areas. Exactly. By Because that local council comes yeah, it's my from my, my party, party. And, and it reflects good on me and yes. I don't even need to raise funds to do those efforts. Yes, exactly. And sometimes local councillors, uh, often they would have their own allocation as well to do community programs. Wow, so they are, they are actually very powerful, uh, local yes. councillor? Yes, yes. So don't don't play play. Uh, you know, when we get a local councillor to explain all these things, uh, it will be you know more apparent to all of you. Wow. Okay, uh, you know, in the interest of time, uh, you know, we're going to skip a couple of topics and go to the last topic for today uh, before we make a plug for the KL Podcast, which is uh, the passing of Devaki Krishnan, since we're talking about local councils and local councillors, she was the first woman elected into public office in Malaysia uh, in 1952 that when there were still local council elections uh, in KL. Uh, she was elected as uh, part, of, part and parcel of the Alliance uh, Coalition, the, the precursor to Barisan National, mm. and she was uh, an, a member of the MIC. And she died 100 years old uh, you know, last week. So this, I think, to me, is an uh, important uh, remembrance, not just because uh, I think uh, you know, sh you know, it was a historic time, but also um, looking at how far we have come and how far we still need to go 
uh, in terms of getting more women into politics, starting at the local council level. Yeah. Do you think it's important for us to have more women in politics? I think so. I think it's very important. Yeah, I think kind of like uh, the like people like Hannah Yo and uh, Tony Ching all coming into politics kind of mm-hmm. gave people this belief and uh, gave people this courage, especially women, to say that, you know, I, I can also contribute. And the truth is, I think they tend to offer a different perspective for men. There are some things that they see that we just somehow don't see because that's just not how we are wired, right? To a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, I right? think women counsellors, uh, MPs, I don't, they will be able to see things like, hey, this place doesn't have good childcare facilities. <laughs> Whereas for us, we are like, uh. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's right, one makes a good childcare, right? <laughs> yeah, for me, as long as they are fat, cool, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> yeah, Give us, uh, you know, something to play on the iPad or something, you know. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, I mean, you know, women definitely bring uh, different perspectives and I think, uh, you know, it's good that we have more uh, women MPs, aduns and counsellors. For my party, you know, we have a 30% quota at the leadership level and then there's a softer 30% quota, you know, in terms of uh, candidates, in terms of candidates at the adun MP and also at the local council level. Mm. So in MPKJ, you know, we, we do, uh, you know, we did meet that quota uh, for my party uh, and yeah, they definitely bring about a sort of like a a very interesting perspective and complements uh, the larger team right. in fulfilling local council right. duties. You know, I think it would be unique in one episode, right? We should bring uh, the DAP's uh, Malay lady mm. MP. Uh. Was it, is it MP? Or oh, yeah, no, that we, we, have yeah, a, we, have a Malay, we have a Malay MP, uh, you know, the Young Safura, who's yeah. the MP for Bentong. Uh, She'll fit all these criteria. Female Malay India P. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Or oh, we could uh, invite one of my former staff, uh, uh, Lily, uh, who is uh, Malay, uh, who has served the party well and uh, is also a local counselor in MPKJ. Uh, and she speaks fluent Mandarin. Wow. Uh, better wow. Mandarin than me. She took uh, Mandarin up to SPM level. Wow. Yeah, wow. could get her to come. Uh, or we could get one of the younger local counselors, uh, Kusa. You know, I'm looking at you. Uh, you know, who was recently appointed as a as a local council local councillor in PJ. Uh, she's young. Um, you know, uh, I think she's uh, not even thirty years mm. old yet. Yeah, and the lo- the the youngest local councillor in uh, MP PJ is actually twenty three years old. Right, so it's good to get the younger people's perspective on this, uh, and to get encourage more people to join. Uh, you know, initiatives that are related to local government. Yep. Okay, yeah, so before we conclude this episode, let's do a little bit of plug for the KL Podfest that's taking place on the 3rd and 4th of February next week. Uh, thank you very much to our Taikos, you know, from Kloas Kejap, Kairi Jamaluddin and Shara Hamdan yes. for taking the lead on this. So for Mr. Money, when is your, you know, your sort of like segment? My segment will be on the 4th of February at uh, 11 to 12.30. Yeah, so just nice before lunch, if you're heading to uh, one you for lunch, yeah, just come by earlier and say hi to us. Okay, and then uh, for Are We Okay, it is taking place on Saturday, 3rd of February, 6.30 to 8 p.m. And the KL Pop Fest is happening at the PJ Performing Arts Centre, located in the new, new wing of One Utama. Okay, so with that, this concludes the latest episode of Are We Okay? the podcast that talks about public policies in ways that are relevant to you, the person on the street, in the shopping mall, or in the Nasi Kanda store. Or for people who are running on track every morning. (laughs) Wherever (laughs) you are, we want to make your life relevant to public policy and public policy relevant to you. So see you next week and have a good week. See you next week, guys.